Good morning, Sarah. Today's idiom is a bit quirky. Cut the mustard. Any guesses on its meaning? Good morning, Mr. Davis. That sounds funny. Is it about cooking? It's an interesting guess, but cut the mustard actually has nothing to do with cooking. This idiom means to meet the required standard or to be good enough to handle a task. It's used to express capability or sufficiency. So, if someone says I can't cut the mustard, they mean I'm not up to the task? Exactly. If someone doubts your ability to cut the mustard, they're questioning whether you can meet the expectations or standards needed for a job or task. On the flip side, proving that you can cut the mustard means you've shown you're capable and competent. Interesting. But why mustard? What does it have to do with meeting standards? The origins of this phrase are a bit murky, but it's believed to have come from an older expression that meant something was genuinely impressive. Mustard has been used metaphorically to signify something strong or pungent, and over time, cutting the mustard came to mean measuring up to a specific standard or expectation. That's a cool background. I'll have to show I can cut the mustard in my next project. That's the spirit, Sarah. With your dedication, I have no doubt you'll more than cut the mustard. It's all about putting in the effort and striving to meet or exceed the standards set before you. Thanks, Mr. Davis. I'm learning so much from these idioms. They really make language fun. I'm glad to hear that, Sarah. Language is not just about words and grammar. It's also about expressions that carry history, culture, and color. Keep up the curiosity and you'll continue to discover the richness of English. I sure will, Mr. Davis. Can't wait for our next lesson. Looking forward to it as well, Sarah. Keep aiming high, and you'll always cut the mustard. See you next time. Bye, Mr. Davis. I've been reviewing the performance reports, and I think we need to have a talk about the new software we deployed last quarter. Yeah, I've been looking at those numbers, too. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? If you're thinking that the software isn't exactly cutting the mustard, then yes, I am. It promised a lot of efficiency improvements, but the reality doesn't match the hype. That's exactly my concern. It's not just about the investment. It's that our team is spending more time troubleshooting than actually benefiting from the supposed features. Right. We had high hopes, but it's becoming clear that this tool isn't the solution we thought it was. It's time we consider alternatives that can truly meet our needs. Agreed. Do we have any data on alternatives that might better serve our purposes? It's crucial we choose a replacement that won't leave us in the same predicament, I've started compiling a list of potential replacements, focusing on those with proven track records in environments similar to ours. I think it's worth setting up some demos. That sounds like a solid plan. Let's not rush the decision this time. We need a solution that not only promises, but delivers. Absolutely. Let's schedule those demos and involve the team in the evaluation process. Their feedback will be invaluable in making sure we pick a tool that can truly cut the mustard. Perfect. I'll coordinate with the teams and get those demos on the calendar. Thanks for taking the initiative on this, Hannah. It's important we get this right. No problem, Evan. It's all about finding the right tools to support our team's success. Let's make this happen. Good morning, Sarah. Today's idiom is cry over spilt milk. What do you think it means? Good morning, Mr. Davis. It sounds like being upset about something that has already happened and can't be changed. Spot on, Sarah. Cry over spilt milk means to be upset or lament about a situation or mistake that cannot be undone or fixed. It's a reminder that it's not useful to dwell on the past or things we cannot change. The phrase encourages us to focus on the present and future instead. I get it. So, 
If I mess up on a test, instead of being upset about it for days, I should learn from it and move on, because I can't change the score. Exactly right, Sarah. While it's natural to feel disappointed when things don't go as planned, dwelling on these feelings won't change the outcome. It's more productive to accept what happened, learn from the experience, and focus on how you can improve next time. That makes a lot of sense, Mr. Davis. I'll try to remember not to cry over spilt milk and look for ways to do better instead. That's a great approach, Sarah. Life is full of unexpected spills, and how we choose to clean them up and move forward is what truly matters. Keeping a positive outlook and learning from our mistakes is key to growth and happiness. Thanks for the advice, Mr. Davis. I feel better knowing that it's okay to make mistakes as long as I don't dwell on them too much. You're welcome, Sarah. Remember, everyone spills a little milk now and then. It's all part of the learning process. I'm here to support you through the spills and the cleanups. Thanks, Mr. Davis. I really appreciate it. Can't wait for our next idiom lesson. I'm looking forward to it, Sarah. Keep up the positive attitude and you'll go far. See you next time. See you then, Mr. Davis. I can't believe I missed the deadline for the grant application. That was a huge opportunity for our project. I understand you're upset, Oliver, but there's no use in crying over spilt milk. What's done is done. Let's focus on what we can do now. You're right, Zoe. It's just hard not to beat myself up over it. I had all the information ready. I just lost track of time. It happens to the best of us. Now, let's think about alternative funding opportunities. There might be other grants or sponsors we haven't considered yet. That's a good idea. I suppose dwelling on the missed grant won't help us move forward. We need to look for other options. Exactly. Let's use this as a learning experience. We can set up reminders and deadlines well in advance for future opportunities. I appreciate your optimism, Zoe. Let's do that. Starting with a thorough search for alternatives seems like the right step. I'll help you with the search. Together, we can cover more ground and maybe find something even better. Thanks, Zoe. It means a lot to have your support. Let's turn this setback into an opportunity. That's the spirit, Oliver. With a bit of effort and creativity, we'll find a way to support our project. Let's get started. Good morning, Sarah. Today's idiom has a bit of mystery to it. Curiosity killed the cat. Any thoughts on what it might mean? Morning, Mr. Davis. It sounds kind of scary. Is it about being too curious about things you shouldn't be? Exactly, Sarah. Curiosity killed the cat is a cautionary saying that warns of the dangers of unnecessary investigation or experimentation. It suggests that being too curious can sometimes lead to trouble or harm. However, there's also a less frequently mentioned part of the saying, satisfaction brought it back, which implies that while curiosity can lead to danger, discovering the truth can also be rewarding. Oh, so it's like saying you should be careful about what you dig into because it might not always end well? That's right. It's a reminder to weigh the risks and benefits of seeking out certain knowledge or getting involved in situations that might be risky or none of your business. Curiosity is a valuable trait, but it's important to exercise it wisely. I see. So, asking questions and learning is good, but I should think about when it's not a good idea to be too nosy. Precisely, Sarah. It's great to ask questions and be eager to learn, but it's also important to know when to step back and respect boundaries or avoid potentially harmful situations. Balancing curiosity with caution is key. Got it, Mr. Davis. I'll remember to be curious, but also to be careful. Thanks for explaining. You're welcome, Sarah. 
I'm glad you're embracing the value of curiosity while also understanding the importance of being cautious. Keep up the good work and never stop asking questions. You just might find the satisfaction that brings the cat back. I will, Mr. Davis. Can't wait for our next lesson. Looking forward to it, Sarah. Keep that curious spirit alive, and you'll learn many fascinating things. See you next time. See you then, Mr. Davis. Did you hear about the mysterious new shop that opened on Main Street? I walked past it this morning, and it looked so intriguing. Yeah, I've heard a few rumors. They say it's some kind of antique store with a lot of rare finds. Why, thinking of checking it out? I'm tempted. There's something about places like that which just draws me in. I can't help but want to explore every nook and cranny. Just be careful, Lena. You know what they say, curiosity killed the cat. Sometimes it's better not to know what's behind the curtain. Oh, Marco, always the cautious one. But isn't it also said, satisfaction brought it back? I think a little adventure could be fun. True, but just make sure this curiosity doesn't lead you into trouble. Some mysteries are better left unsolved. I'll keep that in mind, but I can't make any promises. Who knows what treasures I might find? Maybe I'll discover something truly extraordinary. Well, if you're going, at least let me come with you. That way, if you do stir up any trouble, I'll be there to help you out. Deal. It'll be more fun with you there anyway. Let's unravel this mystery together. All right. It's a date. Let's see what this mysterious shop has in store for us. But Lena, let's not forget to tread carefully. Agreed. But let's also not forget to enjoy the adventure. After all, a little curiosity never hurt anyone, right? We'll see about that. Let's just hope it brings us more satisfaction than trouble. Good morning, Sarah. Today's idiom is, don't beat a dead horse. What do you think it implies? Morning, Mr. Davis. It sounds kind of grim. Does it mean not to waste time on something that's already finished or can't be changed? You've nailed it, Sarah. Don't beat a dead horse means to stop wasting time and effort on a matter that's already been concluded or is no longer changeable. It's a vivid way to say that continuing to argue about or try to change something that's definitively over or settled is pointless. So, if I keep trying to convince my friend to change her mind about a movie she didn't like, even after we've talked about it a lot, am I beating a dead horse? Exactly, Sarah. If her opinion is clearly set and unlikely to change, persisting in the argument doesn't accomplish anything. It's better to acknowledge that some things won't change and to focus your energy on more productive or unresolved issues. I understand now. It's important to know when to move on and not get stuck on something that can't be helped. Precisely. Recognizing when to let go and redirect your efforts is a valuable skill. It saves time and energy for things that can be influenced or improved. Thanks, Mr. Davis. I'll remember not to beat a dead horse and to use my energy wisely. You're welcome, Sarah. It's all about choosing your battles and knowing when something deserves your attention and when it's time to step back. Keep this in mind, and you'll navigate challenges more effectively. Will do, Mr. Davis. I'm learning so much from these idioms. I'm glad to hear that, Sarah. Idioms offer a fun way to gain insights into life's lessons. Looking forward to our next discussion. Me too, Mr. Davis. See you then. I still can't believe they decided to go with another supplier. I thought our presentation was spot on. I know, Nora. We gave it our best shot, but the decision's been made. At this point, don't beat a dead horse. 
We should focus on what we can do next. You're right, Ethan. It's just hard to let go when you've put so much effort into something. But dwelling on it won't change their minds. Exactly. What we can do is analyze what happened, learn from it, and apply those lessons to our next pitch. There's always another opportunity around the corner. That's a healthy perspective. I suppose it's better to concentrate on improving for the future rather than getting stuck on a past we can't change. Absolutely. Let's gather the team, review our approach, and see where we can adjust. We'll come out stronger and more prepared for the next chance. Thanks, Ethan. Your optimism is contagious. I'm ready to move forward and tackle the next challenge with everything we've got. That's the spirit, Nora. Let's turn this experience into a stepping stone for success. Onward and upward. Good morning, Sarah. Ready for today's idiom lesson? Good morning, Mr. Davis. Yes, I'm ready. What's the idiom? Today we're discussing don't count your chickens before they hatch. Any ideas on what this might mean? It sounds like it's about not being too sure about something that hasn't happened yet. Is it like not getting ahead of yourself? Spot on, Sarah. Don't count your chickens before they hatch is a cautionary saying that advises against assuming the outcome of a situation before it actually happens. It's about not being prematurely confident in the success or results of something, since things may not always turn out as expected. Oh, like if I think I'm going to get an A on a test before I even take it, I might be counting my chickens before they hatch? Exactly that, Sarah. It's good to be optimistic, but this idiom reminds us to stay grounded and wait for actual results before celebrating or making plans based on those expected outcomes. Life can be unpredictable, and many factors can influence the final result. I see. So it's better to wait and see how things really turn out instead of assuming. Precisely. It's about patience and realism, recognizing that while hope and confidence are important, they should be balanced with a practical understanding of how things might unfold. Got it, Mr. Davis. I'll try to remember not to count my chickens before they hatch and to wait for things to actually happen. That's a great takeaway, Sarah. Keeping this idiom in mind will help you prepare for various outcomes and appreciate the results as they come without setting yourself up for disappointment. Thanks, Mr. Davis. These idioms are really helpful for understanding life better. You're welcome, Sarah. I'm glad you find them useful. Life is full of valuable lessons, and language has a unique way of capturing them. Looking forward to our next lesson. Me too, Mr. Davis. See you then. So, I've been crunching some numbers, and if all our current deals close as expected, we're looking at a record quarter. That sounds promising, Kevin, but don't count your chickens before they hatch. We've seen deals fall through at the last minute before. You're right, Jasmine. I guess I got a little carried away with the potential numbers. It's just hard not to get excited about the prospects. It's good to be optimistic but we need to stay grounded and focus on ensuring each deal actually closes. Let's keep pushing and following up with our clients. Agreed. I'll make sure to stay on top of everything. We should also prepare for any unexpected turns. Exactly. Let's also brainstorm some backup plans, just in case. It's always better to be overprepared. That's a solid plan. Thanks for keeping me in check, Jasmine. Let's make sure we do everything we can to actually bring these deals home. Anytime, Kevin. We make a great team because we can balance each other out. Let's go secure those deals. Hey, Sarah. I've got an interesting idiom for us to explore today. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Ever heard this one before? Hey, Mr. Davis. 
Yes, I think so. It sounds like advice about not risking everything on one thing, right? You're absolutely right. Don't put all your eggs in one basket is a piece of advice that suggests you should not concentrate all your resources or efforts in one area or plan. Just like if you were to carry all your eggs in one basket and you drop it, you'd lose everything. But if you spread them out across multiple baskets, you're less likely to lose them all at once. That makes a lot of sense. So it's about spreading out your risk? Exactly. It's a reminder to diversify your investments, efforts, or interests. By spreading them out, you reduce the risk of a total loss if one endeavor doesn't work out. It's applicable in finance, business, and even personal matters, like not focusing all your energy on just one hobby or skill. I see. So if I want to invest my savings, I should look into different options instead of putting it all into one thing. That's a smart approach, Sarah. Diversifying your investments can help protect you from significant losses. The same goes for your talents and time. Exploring various interests can lead to a richer, more balanced life. I'll keep that in mind, Mr. Davis. It's better to have a few plans just in case one doesn't work out. Absolutely, Sarah. Life is unpredictable, so having multiple options can make you more resilient. Remember, it's all about finding the right balance and not overcommitting to a single path. Thanks for the advice, Mr. Davis. These idioms really make me think differently about how to approach things. I'm glad to hear that, Sarah. Understanding these sayings can offer valuable life lessons. Keep an open mind, and you'll navigate life's uncertainties with greater ease. I will, Mr. Davis. Can't wait to learn more. There's always more to learn, Sarah. Looking forward to our next discussion. Me too. Thanks again, Mr. Davis. I've been thinking a lot about investing some of my savings. Right now, it's all just sitting in a savings account, and I feel like I could be doing more with it. That's a smart move, Ava. Diversifying your investments can definitely help grow your savings over time. Just remember, don't put all your eggs in one basket. What do you mean by that? It means you shouldn't invest all your money in a single type of investment. Spread it out across different assets like stocks, bonds, and real estate, for example. That way, if one market does poorly, your entire investment doesn't suffer. That makes sense. I've read a bit about diversification, but I'm still a bit unsure about where to start. It can be overwhelming at first, but there are plenty of resources out there to help you. You could also consider talking to a financial advisor. They can help you understand your options and create a diversified investment plan that suits your risk tolerance and financial goals. I think I'll do that. I want to make informed decisions especially when it comes to my financial future. Absolutely. It's the best approach. If you need any help or someone to bounce ideas off, I'm here for you. Thanks, Liam. I really appreciate your advice. I'll definitely take my time to learn more and carefully plan my next steps. Anytime, Ava. Happy to help. Here's to making your money work for you. Sarah, I have something uplifting for us to discuss today. Every cloud has a silver lining. What do you think it means? Oh, Mr. Davis, that sounds positive. Is it about finding something good in bad situations? You've hit the nail on the head. Every cloud has a silver lining is an optimistic idiom suggesting that there is a hopeful or positive aspect to every difficult situation, no matter how hard or negative it seems at first. The idea is that even the darkest clouds can have bright, glowing edges, just as difficulties can have hidden benefits or lessons. That's really nice to think about. So, if I'm going through a tough time, I should look for the silver lining? 
Exactly, Sarah. It's about maintaining hope and looking for the positive outcomes that can emerge from challenges. It could be learning something new about yourself, gaining strength from overcoming obstacles, or simply appreciating the good times more. I like that. It makes me think about tough times a little differently. Like, maybe there's always something good that can come out of them. That's the spirit, Sarah. Life will inevitably have its ups and downs, but if you can find the silver lining, you can navigate through the downs with a bit more ease and emerge stronger and wiser on the other side. I'll remember that, Mr. Davis. It's a really comforting thought. I'm glad you think so, Sarah. Embracing this perspective can make all the difference in how you face life's challenges. Keep looking for that silver lining, and you'll find rays of light even on the cloudiest days. Thanks for such an encouraging lesson, Mr. Davis. I'm definitely going to try and see the silver lining in everything. You're welcome, Sarah. I have no doubt you'll find many silver linings. And remember, I'm here to help you navigate through both the clear skies and the stormy ones. Thanks, Mr. Davis. It's great to know I've got support. Always, Sarah. Looking forward to our next enlightening conversation. Me too. See you then. I heard about the layoffs at your company, Ben. I'm so sorry. Are you doing okay? It's been tough, Grace. I wasn't expecting to lose my job, but I've been trying to remind myself that every cloud has a silver lining. That's a positive way to look at it. Have you found your silver lining yet? Actually, yes. I've always wanted to start my own business, and this could be the push I needed. I'm seeing this as an opportunity to finally pursue my passion. That's fantastic, Ben. It sounds like you're turning a difficult situation into a stepping stone for something greater. I hope so. I've started outlining my business plan and researching the market. It's a bit daunting, but also exciting to think about the possibilities. It's great to hear you're taking proactive steps toward your dream. If there's any way I can help, just let me know. Thanks, Grace. I really appreciate your support. It means a lot during a time like this. Of course, Ben. Remember, tough times often lead to great beginnings. I'm here for you, every step of the way. Thank you, Grace. Here's to hoping this cloud really does have a silver lining. Sarah, today's topic is a common expression. Feel a bit under the weather. Any thoughts on what this might mean? Hmm, Mr. Davis, it sounds like it's about the weather, but I'm guessing it has nothing to do with rain or storms, right? Right you are, Sarah. Feel a bit under the weather doesn't actually relate to the weather outside. Instead, it's a way of saying someone isn't feeling well, usually in a mild or temporary way. It's like saying you're not at your best health-wise, maybe due to a cold or feeling tired. Oh, I see. So if I wake up with a sore throat and decide to stay in bed, I could say I'm feeling a bit under the weather? Exactly, Sarah. It's a gentle way of expressing that you're not feeling 100% without specifying exactly what's wrong. People often use it to explain why they might take it easy or skip activities they would normally enjoy. That makes sense. It's a nicer way to say you're sick without going into details. Precisely. And because it's so common, it's a phrase that's easily understood without needing to elaborate. It's a good one to use when you're not feeling great but still want to keep things light. Got it, Mr. Davis. I hope I don't have to use it often, but it's good to know. I hope so too, Sarah. Remember, taking care of yourself is important, so if you ever do feel under the weather, it's okay to take a step back and rest. Your health comes first. Thanks, Mr. Davis. I'll make sure to listen to my body and rest when I need to. That's the right approach, Sarah. If you're ever not sure what to do or if you need advice, 
You can always talk to me or a trusted adult. I will, Mr. Davis. Thanks for being so understanding and for teaching me these expressions. They really help. You're welcome, Sarah. Learning how to express yourself is just as important as taking care of your health. I'm here to help with both. See you in our next lesson. Looking forward to it, Mr. Davis. Take care. Hey, Maya, you've been pretty quiet today. Is everything okay? Oh, hey, Lucas. Yeah, I'm all right, just feeling a bit under the weather. I think I might be coming down with something. I'm sorry to hear that. It's tough to stay on top of things when you're not feeling well. Have you been able to take anything for it? I've had some tea and tried to rest, but it's been hard with all the deadlines this week. I don't want to fall behind on my work. I understand but your health comes first. Maybe it's best if you take a day off to fully recover. The team and I can cover for you. Thanks, Lucas. I appreciate it, but I'd hate to leave you all with extra work. Don't worry about us. We've got it covered. It's important you take the time to get better. We can handle things here. That's really kind of you. Maybe taking a day off to rest properly is a good idea. I don't want to risk getting even worse. Definitely the right call. Just send over what you've been working on and we'll take it from there. Get some rest, Maya, and feel better soon. Thanks so much, Lucas. I'll make sure to pass on my work before I log off. Hopefully, I'll be back to normal in no time. No rush, Maya. Your health is the priority. Get well soon. Sarah, have you ever heard the expression, give someone the cold shoulder? What do you think it means? I think I've heard it before, Mr. Davis. Is it when someone ignores another person or doesn't show them any warmth or friendliness? That's exactly right, Sarah. To give someone the cold shoulder means to deliberately ignore someone or treat them in an unfriendly manner. It's like showing someone your shoulder instead of facing them, metaphorically speaking, to indicate you're not interested in interacting. Why would someone do that, Mr. Davis? There could be several reasons, Sarah. Maybe there's been a misunderstanding or conflict, or perhaps one person is trying to show they're upset or displeased with the other. It's a nonverbal way of expressing disapproval or discomfort without engaging in an outright confrontation. That doesn't sound very nice. What should you do if someone gives you the cold shoulder? It can definitely be hurtful, Sarah. If it happens to you, it might be helpful to try and talk to the person about it when they seem more receptive. Sometimes, clearing the air can resolve misunderstandings. But remember, it's also important to respect their space and not force a conversation if they're not ready. I see. Communication is key, but so is giving space. That's a bit of a balance, isn't it? Absolutely, Sarah. Finding that balance between addressing issues and respecting boundaries is crucial in any relationship. And remember, it's okay to seek help from a trusted adult if you're unsure how to handle the situation. Thanks, Mr. Davis. I'll keep that in mind. It's good to know there are ways to deal with it constructively. You're welcome, Sarah. Navigating social interactions can be tricky, but it's all part of learning how to build strong and healthy relationships. Don't hesitate to ask if you have more questions. I won't, Mr. Davis. Thanks for helping me understand these expressions. They're really useful for figuring out social stuff. My pleasure, Sarah. Understanding the language we use can definitely help in understanding each other better. Looking forward to our next discussion. Me too, Mr. Davis. See you then. Hey, Alex. I've noticed that every time I try to talk to Jamie lately, I get the cold shoulder. Did I do something wrong? Oh, I've noticed that too. 
but I don't think it's anything you did. Jamie's been under a lot of stress with work and some personal stuff. I think it's just Jamie's way of dealing with things right now. I see. I was worried I had accidentally upset Jamie somehow. It's tough feeling like you're being ignored, especially when you don't know why. Yeah, I get that. It might help to give Jamie some space for now, but maybe send a message saying you're there if they want to talk. Sometimes knowing someone is there can make all the difference. That's good advice, Alex. I'll try that. I hope Jamie feels better soon. It's hard seeing a friend go through a tough time and not being able to help. Definitely. And remember, it's important to not take it personally. We all handle stress in different ways. Jamie's lucky to have a friend like you who cares. Thanks, Alex. I'll send Jamie a message later today. Hopefully things will get better soon. They will. And if you need to talk or if there's anything I can do to help, I'm here. I appreciate that, Alex. It's good to know I have someone to talk to as well. Sarah, have you ever heard of going on a wild goose chase? No, Mr. Davis, but it sounds like a fun adventure, is it? It does sound adventurous, doesn't it? However, going on a wild goose chase isn't as fun as it might seem. It means to pursue something that's unattainable or non-existent, leading to a fruitless endeavor. It's like chasing after something you can never catch, wasting time and effort on a pointless task. Oh, so it's like if I spent hours looking for a book in the library that isn't even there? Exactly, Sarah. It's a situation where you're led to believe you're after something possible, but in reality, the goal is just a wild, uncatchable goose. It emphasizes the futility and frustration of such efforts. I can see how that would be frustrating. So, it's important to make sure something is really possible before I start chasing after it? Precisely. It's good to question and verify the reality of what you're pursuing to avoid these wild goose chases. It teaches the importance of critical thinking and validating information before acting on it. Got it, Mr. Davis. I'll remember to check if the book is actually in the library before I start looking next time. That's a wise approach, Sarah. Applying this mindset can save you a lot of time and energy, not just in the library, but in many aspects of life. Always question and confirm before embarking on your chases. I will, Mr. Davis. Thanks for explaining. I learned so much from these idioms. I'm glad to hear that, Sarah. These expressions offer more than just linguistic fun. They provide valuable life lessons. Can't wait to share more with you. Me neither. See you next time, Mr. Davis. Until then, Sarah, keep questioning and stay curious. So, I spent the entire afternoon trying to find that exclusive record store downtown, only to find out it closed down months ago. Talk about going on a wild goose chase. Oh no, Riley, that's frustrating. I hate when that happens. All that time and effort for nothing. Who gave you the tip about the store? It was a post I found on an online forum. Guess I should have checked the date before I took off. Learned my lesson the hard way. It's easy to get caught up in the excitement of hunting down something unique. But yeah, always good to verify those leads first. Did the day turn out to be a total loss, at least? Not entirely. On the bright side, I stumbled upon a little cafe I'd never noticed before. They had the best coffee and vinyl records playing in the background. It kind of made up for the wild goose chase. That sounds like a hidden gem. See, not all who wander are lost. Maybe the universe just had a different plan for your day. Ha, huh, perhaps you're right. Next time, though, I'll do my homework before setting out. But hey, if you're ever in the mood for great coffee, I know just the place. Definitely. It sounds like my kind of spot. Let's check it out together next time. And who knows? 
we might discover some new places along the way. No wild goose chases involved. It's a deal. Adventures are always better with company anyway. Let's make plans for next weekend. Sounds perfect. Looking forward to it, Riley. And who knows, maybe we'll find our own exclusive spots along the way. Sarah, today I've got a juicy idiom for us. Hear it on the grapevine. Any guesses what this one's about? That sounds interesting, Mr. Davis. Is it about hearing news from someone else, like gossip or rumors? Spot on, Sarah. Hear it on the grapevine means to learn something through informal communication or rumors, not from an official source. The phrase comes from the way grapevines intertwine symbolizing the way information weaves its way through people, much like vines. So, if I hear about a surprise party for a friend, but nobody tells me directly, I heard it on the grapevine? Exactly, Sarah. It's all about the way information spreads, often in a roundabout way. While hearing it on the grapevine can sometimes lead to discovering interesting news, it's important to take such information with a grain of salt, since it might not always be accurate. I see. It's like playing telephone. The message might change as it goes from person to person. Precisely. It's a reminder to critically evaluate the information you hear, especially if it's through the grapevine, to avoid misunderstandings or spreading unverified news. Got it, Mr. Davis. I'll remember to check the facts before I believe or share something I heard this way. That's a wise approach, Sarah. It's always good to be mindful of where and how you get your information. Being discerning and seeking out the truth is crucial in a world full of grapevines. Thanks for the advice, Mr. Davis. These idioms are really helpful for understanding how to navigate conversations and information. You're welcome, Sarah. I'm here to help you make sense of these expressions and what they mean for everyday life. Looking forward to our next discussion. Me too, Mr. Davis. See you then. Hey, Taylor. Did you hear about the new manager taking over our department next month? No, I hadn't heard anything official yet. But I did hear it on the grapevine that we might be getting someone from the London office. Is that true? Yeah, that's the word going around. It seems like they're bringing in someone with a lot of experience in market expansion to shake things up a bit. Interesting. I wonder how that's going to change the dynamics around here. Hopefully, it'll be a good thing for the team. I'm optimistic. From what I've heard on the grapevine, the new manager has a track record of really boosting team morale and performance. Could be exactly what we need. That does sound promising. It'll be nice to have a fresh perspective, especially someone with a successful background. I'm curious to see what new strategies they'll introduce. Same here. I'm all for changes that can help us grow and improve. Let's keep our ears open and see if we can learn more about what's coming. Definitely. And maybe we should also start thinking about any suggestions or ideas we could bring to the table. It could be a great opportunity to show our new manager what we're capable of. Great thinking, Taylor. Let's make sure we're prepared to make a good impression. It could be the start of an exciting new chapter for us all. Agreed. Here's to new beginnings and positive changes. Let's stay positive and see where this leads. Sarah, before we wrap up today, let's tackle one more idiom. Hit the sack. Any idea what this might be about? Hmm. Mr. Davis, it sounds kind of funny. Is it about hitting something? It does sound humorous, doesn't it? But hit the sack actually means to go to bed. It comes from the days when mattresses were often sacks filled with straw or feathers. So, Saying you're going to hit the sack is a colloquial way of saying you're off to sleep. Oh, that makes sense. 
So, when my mom tells me it's time to hit the sack, she's telling me it's bedtime. Exactly. It's a casual and somewhat playful way of saying it's time to call it a night. Remembering the origin of these idioms can make them even more fun to use. I'll start using that. I'm going to hit the sack sounds much cooler than just saying I'm going to bed. I'm glad you think so, Sarah. Language is full of these colorful expressions that add character and fun to our everyday conversations. Thanks, Mr. Davis. I'm learning so much from you. Now, I guess it's almost time for me to hit the sack. I'm happy to hear you're enjoying these lessons, Sarah. Remember, a good night's sleep is important, so hitting the sack at a reasonable hour is always a good idea. Looking forward to more idiomatic adventures with you. Me too, Mr. Davis. Good night. Good night, Sarah. Rest well and dream big. Wow, what a long day. I can't remember the last time I was this exhausted. I hear you. It's been nonstop from the moment we started. My feet are killing me. Yeah, I think it's about time to hit the sack. I need to recharge if we're going to do it all over again tomorrow. Hitting the sack sounds like the best idea you've had all day. A good night's sleep is exactly what we need. Definitely. I can't imagine pushing through another day like today without proper rest. Let's make sure we're well rested. Agreed. I'll set my alarm a bit later so I can get some extra sleep. Hopefully that helps. Good idea. I'll do the same. Maybe a hot shower before bed will help relax those muscles. Sounds like a plan. All right, let's call it a night then. See you in the morning, Evan. See you, Jamie. Here's to hoping we wake up feeling refreshed and ready to tackle another day. Sarah, let's dive into a new idiom today, in hot water. What comes to mind when you hear that? It sounds like being in a bath that's too hot, Mr. Davis, but I'm guessing it has another meaning. You're on the right track thinking beyond the literal sense. Being in hot water actually means you're in trouble or facing a difficult situation. It's like when you've done something that might lead to consequences, and now you're dealing with the heat of the moment. So, if I forget to do my homework and have to explain it to you, I'd be in hot water? Exactly, Sarah. It's used to describe situations where you might face repercussions for your actions. The phrase paints a vivid picture of discomfort similar to how being in water that's too hot would feel uncomfortable. I see. I'll try to stay out of hot water by keeping up with my assignments then. That's a good plan, Sarah. Staying out of hot water is often about thinking ahead and considering the consequences of our actions. It's a useful idiom for reminding us to be mindful of how we navigate challenges. Got it, Mr. Davis. I'll remember that it's better to avoid trouble than to find a way out of it. Wise words, Sarah. Facing challenges directly and responsibly is always preferable to ending up in hot water. But remember, if you ever do find yourself in a difficult spot, it's important to address the situation honestly and seek solutions. Thanks, Mr. Davis. I'll keep that in mind. These idioms really help me understand these concepts better. I'm glad to hear that, Sarah. Language has a unique way of encapsulating life's lessons. Don't hesitate to reach out if you ever feel like you're in hot water, in class, or in life. I'm here to help. I appreciate it, Mr. Davis. Thanks for being such a great teacher. My pleasure, Sarah. Remember, learning is a journey, and it's okay to navigate through some hot water along the way. Looking forward to our next lesson. Me too, Mr. Davis. See you then. Did you hear about the mix-up with the client's order? 
I just found out this morning, and it looks like we're in hot water. Yeah, I caught wind of that. The client was expecting their delivery last week, right? How bad is the situation? Pretty bad. The order was delayed due to a miscommunication in the supply chain, and now the client is threatening to pull their contract. We need to come up with a solution fast. That's not good. Being in hot water like this could really hurt our reputation. Have we reached out to apologize and explain the situation? I'm drafting an email as we speak. I plan to offer them a discount on their next order and expedite shipping at no extra cost. Hopefully, that will smooth things over. Sounds like a solid plan. Maybe we should also set up a meeting to discuss how we can prevent this from happening in the future. We can't afford to be in hot water with our clients again. Absolutely. I was thinking the same thing. Let's schedule a team meeting for tomorrow to review our processes and see where the breakdown occurred. Great idea. It's crucial we get to the bottom of this to maintain our client relationships. If there's anything I can do to help, let me know. Will do, Jordan. Thanks for the support. Let's get through this and come out stronger on the other side. Sarah, have you ever heard the saying, it takes two to tango? I think so, Mr. Davis. Doesn't it have something to do with dancing? Yes, it does relate to dancing, but it's used to convey a broader idea. It takes two to tango means that certain situations or actions require the participation or agreement of two people. It's often used to suggest that both parties involved in a situation are responsible for it, not just one. Oh, like if two friends get into trouble together, it's not just one person's fault because it takes two to tango? Precisely, Sarah. Whether it's a disagreement, a partnership, or any situation where two people are involved, this idiom reminds us that responsibility is often shared. Just like in the dance, both partners must work together to make it successful. That makes a lot of sense. So I should remember that in relationships or teamwork, both sides have a part to play. Exactly, Sarah. Recognizing that it takes two to tango encourages us to think about our own role in interactions with others and to understand the importance of cooperation and shared responsibility. I'll keep that in mind, Mr. Davis. It seems like a helpful way to look at things, especially when working on group projects. That's the right attitude, Sarah. Applying this understanding can lead to more effective communication and collaboration. It's about acknowledging the contributions and responsibilities of everyone involved. Thanks, Mr. Davis. I can see how this idiom is about much more than just dancing. You're welcome, Sarah. It's wonderful to see you making connections between these idioms and real-life situations. Keep up the good work, and remember, life's a dance that often requires more than one dancer. I will, Mr. Davis. Thanks for all the insights. Looking forward to learning more. Anytime, Sarah. There's always more to discover, and I'm here to guide you through it. See you in our next lesson. I just don't understand why every project meeting ends in a deadlock with the design team. It's like we're speaking different languages. I know what you mean, Sarah, but remember it takes two to tango. We might need to consider that we're part of the problem, too. That's a fair point, Tom. Maybe we're not being clear enough about our expectations or understanding their constraints. Exactly. It might help if we try to approach the next meeting with a mindset geared towards compromise and collaboration. You're right. It's easy to blame the other side, but we have to acknowledge our role in these communications. I'll make an effort to be more open-minded and see if we can meet halfway. Great attitude, Sarah. I'll do the same. Let's also prepare some clear examples and potential solutions to present. It might make the dialogue more constructive. That sounds like a plan. We need to work together if we're going to achieve the best outcome for the project. Absolutely.
Let's set the tone for cooperation and mutual respect. After all, it takes two to tango, and I believe we can lead by example. Agreed. I'm feeling more optimistic about our next meeting already. Thanks for the pep talk, Tom. Anytime, Sarah. Here's to a more collaborative future. Sarah, today's phrase is, jump on the bandwagon. What do you think that means? It sounds like joining a group doing something popular, Mr. Davis. Is that right? Spot on, Sarah. Jump on the bandwagon refers to the act of joining others in doing something that has become very popular, often to gain the benefits of a growing trend. Originally, it came from the practice of politicians joining popular parades on a bandwagon to gain public favor. So if a new game becomes popular at school and I start playing it because everyone else is, am I jumping on the bandwagon? Exactly, Sarah. It's about adopting a popular activity, idea, or cause, mainly because it's popular and sometimes without fully believing in it yourself. It shows how social influence can affect our choices. I see. It's like following the crowd. But is it always bad to jump on the bandwagon? Good question, Sarah. It's not necessarily bad. Sometimes, things become popular because they're genuinely good or fun. The key is to be mindful of why you're joining in. Are you doing it because you're genuinely interested or just because everyone else is? That makes sense, Mr. Davis. I'll think about why I'm joining something before I jump on the bandwagon. That's a wise approach, Sarah. It's important to make choices that reflect your true interests and values. Remember, it's okay to join in on trends, but it's also okay to stand out and be yourself. Thanks, Mr. Davis. I'll remember that. It's more important to be true to myself than to follow the crowd. Exactly, Sarah. Being true to yourself is always in style. If you ever find yourself wanting to jump on the bandwagon, take a moment to consider if it aligns with who you are and what you believe in. I will, Mr. Davis. Thanks for helping me understand these idioms and what they mean for my life. Anytime, Sarah. I'm here to help you navigate through these expressions and the lessons they carry. Looking forward to our next chat. Me too, Mr. Davis. See you then. I've noticed a lot of companies are starting to use virtual reality for their remote meetings. It's becoming quite the trend. Yeah, I've seen that too. It seems like everyone's trying to jump on the bandwagon. Do you think we should consider it for our team? Honestly, I'm a bit skeptical. Just because everyone else is doing it doesn't necessarily mean it's the right move for us. Jumping on the bandwagon can sometimes lead to hasty decisions. That's a good point. It's important to evaluate whether it actually adds value to our operations or if it's just a novelty. Exactly. I think we should look into the benefits and drawbacks more before making any decisions. If it can genuinely enhance our team's productivity and collaboration, then I'm all for it. Agreed. Let's do some research and maybe even trial it with a small group first. We can gather some feedback before deciding if it's worth implementing across the board. Sounds like a plan. It's better to be informed and deliberate about these things than to just jump on the bandwagon without due consideration. Absolutely. I'll start looking into options and gather some data. Let's approach this with an open mind, but remain cautious. Perfect, Lena. I'm glad we're on the same page. Let's make sure any new tool or trend we adopt is truly beneficial for our team. Good morning, Sarah. Today, we're diving into the idiom, cut corners. Have you heard it before? Good morning, Mr. Davis. Yeah, I think my mom says it when she's talking about someone not doing a job properly. That's a good observation. 
Cut corners means to do something in the easiest, quickest, or cheapest way, often sacrificing quality or skipping steps. It's like taking a shortcut that might save time or money, but doesn't result in the best outcome. So, if I do my homework in a hurry and don't check my answers, am I cutting corners? Exactly. When you rush through your homework without reviewing your work, you're cutting corners. While it might save you time in the moment, it could mean making mistakes that could have been avoided with a little more effort. I see. It's better to take your time and do it right than to cut corners and not be happy with the results. Absolutely, Sarah. Quality is often more important than just finishing quickly. Taking shortcuts can lead to problems down the line, whether it's with schoolwork, building something, or any task, really. Got it, Mr. Davis. I'll make sure to do things properly and not cut corners, especially on important tasks. That's the spirit, Sarah. Striving for quality and taking the time to do things right will serve you well in the long run. Remember, it's about finding the balance between efficiency and thoroughness. I'll remember that. Thanks for explaining, Mr. Davis. These idioms really help me understand these concepts better. You're welcome, Sarah. I'm glad you're finding them useful. Learning to communicate effectively and understanding the nuances of language can be very rewarding. Keep up the great work. I will, Mr. Davis. Looking forward to our next lesson. As am I, Sarah. Have a fantastic day and remember, no cutting corners on your way to excellence. I won't, Mr. Davis. Bye for now. I was reviewing the project plan, and it looks like we're behind schedule. I know we're under pressure, but I really think we shouldn't cut corners to catch up. I understand your concern, Lena, but what do you suggest we do? We're already stretched thin as it is. Well, cutting corners might save us time now, but it could lead to bigger issues down the line. Maybe we could prioritize the project tasks and see if there are any we can delay without impacting the overall timeline too much. That's a fair point. Quality shouldn't be compromised. If we rush and miss something important, it could damage our reputation and lead to more work in the long run. Exactly. I believe focusing on the critical components and ensuring they're done right will benefit us more than trying to speed through everything. Okay, let's sit down with the team and go through the project plan again. We can identify what's essential and what can wait. It's important to keep the integrity of our work intact. I'm glad you agree. It'll take some effort to reorganize, but I'm confident it'll lead to a better outcome for the project and for us. Thanks for bringing this up, Lena. It's crucial we maintain our standards, even under pressure. Let's make sure we do this right. 